I, I need to turn. Hi, uh, tonight we're gonna have Dave Waits uh, tell us what he's been working on in the Wednesday night seminar. Dave. So this is a cell, um, and it's fluorescent and labeled, that's why it's green. But what you can see, this is the nucleus of the cell, this is several cells, the nucleus of the cell, and you see there are these green dots in the cell. So this is something that actually was discovered by, originally discovered by a former student from here. Uh, he's a student in my group, maybe 10 years ago. Um, he's a physicist, but worked in a biology lab, and it's exactly the sort of thing that a physicist would discover. Um, what he realized is these are proteins in the cell that are phase set and form concentrated regions of protein in the cell without having a membrane. So, like nucleus has a lot of protein uh, DNA inside it, but it's got a membrane. And organelles um, and mitochondria also have uh, membranes. Around. So you see concentrated regions in the cell, but they're all concentrated because they're surrounded by these membranes. But these are not. And they're just a phase separation. And if you're a physicist, you understand phase separation. You know exactly what phase separation is. It's not a surprising but it was really a big surprise to biologists that that happened. And if you watch and this, I'll show you the movies of this. If you watch them, you can see that these are basically liquid drops that can diffuse around and eventually recombine and form a larger drop. They just coalesce like that, like two drops of water in a protein. So this was a big surprise. Um, and um, since it was discovered by a former student, I didn't want to study it. It's something really super interesting, but I didn't want to study it. I wanted him to just go on to it himself. Uh, so I stayed away from it for 10 years, but then the students in my group came and said, yeah, I have to look at this. And another former person that I was, had spent time in my group came to me and said, you really have to do this. And the reason he wanted to do this, he says, look, you find these things everywhere. And in this case, uh, you can see what's happening is under stress. So if you take a cell and you expose it to chemo, uh, to, to therapeutic drugs, to, to chemo, chemotherapy drugs, you often form these little granules. And what does that do? Well, it does a bunch of things. First of all, it traps messenger RNA. So that changes the expression level of the cells. It traps um, different proteins. It changes the functionality of the cell. You find them in the nucleus, you find them in the, in the rest of the cell, you find them on the surface. So they're everywhere. So he said, you know, they're really important. It's a phase boundary that's causing this. So you change the conditions just a bit and you can make them appear and disappear. It's just this delicate phase boundary. What if we tried to find drugs that would um, impact the phase boundary? That would be a totally new way of of looking for drugs. And so the first thing we did, we started a little company. And there are like four different companies started at the same time to do that. Um, and so we had a lot of fun trying to understand. The second thing we did was try to understand the nature of these things. And um, one thing we tried to do was understand what they're like. And so there are these concentrated regions of proteins. And then proteins can interact in different ways, and particularly if you put RNA there, the RNA can sort of bind the proteins. And 
they may not be liquid. They may ultimately become solid. So we ask, just could we find a way of telling whether they're liquid or solid? Um, why is this not? Sorry. Uh, my computer is hung up. Uh, let's see if we can. It's really hung up. Uh, maybe I think maybe this is. Yeah, sorry. Um, Sorry, Josh here. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry about that, guys. Probably have too many things open or something. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, one of the cool things, I won't go into the details, but one of the really super cool things about these is that. It's just a phase beam. So we don't have to do it in the cell. We can take it outside of the cell and do it just in a small container of, uh, of fluid. And that turned out to be a really nice way of studying the phase behavior and also studying the structure. Uh, so here's an example where we've reassembled them just on a glass slide. These are the drops. They're fluorescent labeled, and you can see Watch right here. You can see two drops come together and merge. So this is made with a um, protein called FOS. It's uh, fused under sarcoma. It's a protein that's actually implicated in uh, neurological diseases like Alzheimer's. And the reason is is that it can bind together to form permanent bonds. So if you just wait and watch these things age. You see this something like this happens. Now watch what happens when these two close to them. These three, watch them. They get dimmer because they're the group pressing the See, they don't they don't merge. So what does that tell you right away? They don't merge. So they're solid, right? They're solid uh, particles. They can't merge. They can diffuse, but they can't merge. So the question is, can we see how they go from liquid to solid? Just a simple experiment like that. Well, here's a way of just probing it. What you do is uh, this is a simple uh, experimental technique called micro-pipat aspiration. You use a small pipette. Uh, this is about 10 microns in diameter. You just take a pipette and you pull it under a flame, heat it up and pull it. And you get good at this and you can pull them and you can get them these long, narrow barbers, and you connect it up to a constant pressure in the back, and you just suck on it. And you can see they flow in. Right? It flows in. Actually, you can measure the curvature, the curvature here, the curvature here, you know the pressure. There's a little class pressure. You can measure all the properties of the, uh, of the, uh, of the drop. But if you look here, um, Watch when you pull this one in, it, stop, it doesn't pull, it stops. And this one, you let it, let it out. Oh, that's the solid, right? So that's the difference between a liquid and a solid. You can just see that, you can measure it. So the question is can we measure it some way where we don't have to make contact with it? Can we measure it some way that we can understand it so we could do it in itself? So here are just some images taken. Taken with a confocal microscope. Does anybody know what a confocal microscope is? Okay, a microscope is a very, very simple concept. Basically, you sight the sample with a diffraction limited laser. So you focus the laser to as thin a point or a small uh, spot as you can. It's diffraction limited. And then you take the light that's scattered, or if it's fluorescent, you take the fluorescent light and you pass it back through um, another pinhole. That's exactly the same size as this diffraction limit. And so all the light that comes right from here will go through the pinhole. But anything that's over here 
it doesn't get to, you know. So it's a way of making a three dimensional image of that one spot. And then you just scan the laser and you make an image of the whole sample. You can make a three dimensional image. So we use this a lot to, to, uh, to study the behavior of. So is this then similar to like holography? Same principle? It's not. Holography okay. is a um, um, an interference. Oh, um, yes. Okay. This is not an interference. This is just okay. just diffraction. Diffraction. Okay. But hold that thought. Okay. Hold that thought because I'm going to show you something that's sort of holographic a bit, and then we're going to make it that take advantage of it. That's okay. so a good good question. This is just scanning it through the sample. Okay. So you can see. You're taking cuts of it, it's getting smaller as it goes from the bottom. If it's wire, you get that middle diameter, it gets narrow. But if we look here in the center, you see something that looks like this. Huh? You see something that looks like, like this. This is taking it over time. So, what does that remind you? Show you. Look, look carefully at that way at my way. Turn the lights out. No, you don't have to. Look around the side of it. See the little spots? It's not just one spot, it's little spots. Those are speckle spots. Did you see? No. So those are speckles. Now, what causes a speckle? Speckle causes, if I have something scattering, scattering random, and I look at the light here, it's coming from all these different random places. I can only measure with my eye, I can only measure intensity, not field. But the intensity is the sum of all the fields, right? So if I have random contributions, I got some things that are adding constructively, some things adding destructively, they're all adding up randomly. And so I get some things that maybe it's bright, maybe it's dark. But it's just like some random addition of the field. If I move over like this, then the path lengths have all changed. When they change by a wavelength, then whatever is bright becomes dark, right? Because it was a half a wavelength. Everything that was adding a constructive part is now destructive. So this is seeing spectral. I saw that. I was just amazed because you're looking at a fractional limited spot. I don't see how you could see something that was summing up with this random distribution. But where I was wrong is that as I move over, I get whatever it is. If it's scattered light, sometimes it's bright, sometimes it's this. So that tells me I see these speckles uh, from this. If I move the laser, you see the speckle sort of change. And the reason that you see this change in the light patterns is Whatever's causing the scattering is moving by half a wavelength. So this lets me look at the dynamics of whatever's causing the pattern. And so here's a, just a little schematic of it. If I have two scattering objects, they scatter here, and I see the interference between them. But if I move one with respect to the other, the interference pattern changes. And if I just look at one spot with my eye, I see something that fluctuates like this. It fluctuates in time. And if I just measure the correlation of that, just what happens as a function of time, it'll look something this way. I have a long delay between what I'm seeing here and what I'm seeing here. If I measure just the correlation function, I can measure the characteristic time. And that time tells me how long it takes for things to move away. So I can go back and I can look at two networks. That's not mine. Oh, sorry. I can go back and I can look at the um, at the these fluctuations, and now the fact that they're flashing tells me that something is moving by half a wavelength. So I can go and look at different times, different ages, and you can see before that was when it was first formed. Now it's 
24 hours, it's decaying, it's fluctuating at a much slower rate. So I have to just measure the fluctuations. Here's the, here's a, here's a um, comparison of something in Zoom makes, makes it slow, but this is fluctuating much faster. And this is fluctuating much slower. Immediately, that tells me something is slowing down. And I can analyze this. Um, yeah, I can analyze the fluctuations. This is the more rapid one. I, or this is any of them. I just look at one of the spots. This is not very much fluctuations and more, the intensity is more or less constant in time. If I look at one that's fluctuating more, here the, the fluctuations, the intensity is, is lower because it goes dark. And if I make a correlation function, I see there's something that's correlated at early times. I won't go through all the analysis, I'll show you what we can do. Um, This is what it looks like when we look at uh, something that's not decaying. You see, there's a bit of a decay that is more or less constant. A uh, spot that's decaying decays more rapidly and goes basically to the noise. I don't want to go through the details, but I have studied things long enough that I know exactly what I'm seeing. This is a stretch exponential. It's sometimes it decays, sometimes it doesn't. Exactly what does that, I can tell you. Is something that's some kind of network structure. So I'm looking at some region, but it's connected to this large network. And so it's moving like this. And this thing is moving because it's moving like this. It's moving because the whole arm is moving. It's moving because the whole sample is moving. Each of these has a, have a different decay rates. So if I add a sum of exponentials, I always get a stretch exponential. So as soon as you see that, you know how to analyze it. And then you can do uh, a spatial correlation. You can say, well, let me look at all the all the, um, this is all the places that decay very slowly, these are the bright spots, these are the, the amount of decay, but just look at this. If you just step back, the bright spots are things that decay more slowly. You can sort of see there's a correlation. So we can analyze the spatial correlation and we can just analyze it in a very simple way. Um, it's something that, people did 30 years ago, uh, somebody recognized that if you fill space, but don't fill all of space, then things don't have an uh, integer dimension, have a fractional dimension called fractals. And this is exactly the analysis that you would do. This shows that this is a fractal. What's a fractal? It's something that's filling space, but not, not all of space. And so if I want to have something that's connected together as a network, there's lots of fluid in between, but it's a solid network outside. That's exactly what you're seeing. So this is a way we now understand exactly why the um, why the uh, when you aspirate that way. I bet it that it was a solid because there's some kind of network inside. There's still fluid, but there's a network inside. And so this is a direct evidence that these things can become um, solid like and sort of pathological, but now we're just scattered, so we can do this in cells as well. So we're trying to do this in cells, and this is in fact the reason that let's see if this works. No, but um, it just takes a long time, I think. My screen is showing something else. Oh, this is the blue one. Yeah. Oh, it looks oh like no, and that, yeah, that's right. I, have to I don't have to share. Sorry. Let me do that. Let me share this. Uh, I'll share it to you. And then I'll go back. So this is just the website. This is called Common Zone. That's the company that we started because trying to understand when these uh, little droplets form and when they become solid. They're becoming solid because, for example, they 
um, capture messenger RNA, and that glues the proteins. Or they're becoming solid because they're forming these um, um, beta sheet bonds, which is the first step in something like Alzheimer's. Um, so understanding that really is super important in terms of understanding pathological effects of these things. Drug, the, the drug discovery or the drug implications of that. So just being able to understand the nature of this and understand whether they're solid in a cell is a way now we can ask, are they causing problems? And if we add a drug, does that prevent it from uh, causing problems? And can we add a drug that doesn't actually affect the protein itself, but affects the phase behavior? So it just changes the way the phase behavior just prevents or induces these uh, droplets. Um, exactly, exactly, but it's a completely different way of looking for it, of trying to discover it. So, in fact, um, this is sort of cool. This is um, this is the the reason that we can play a role uh, besides understanding the physics. It's a way that we can play a role in the screening. Um, this is a drop of water inside. Drops is maybe a couple of microns. So it's got a picoliter of fluid. So now you can make, if you want to measure a two dimensional phase diagram, you can measure all the points in that two dimensional thousand measurement. Thousand times 10 to the minus 12, 10 to the minus 9. You use the nanometer of fluid to measure a phase diagram. Now you can ask, what do I do with drug? Do I, how do I change the phase boundary? Maybe it, 100 measurements, so that's 100 nanometers of fluid. You can do lots of experiments. You make, you make maybe a thousand drops per second, so you do a whole experiment in a few seconds using nanometers of fluid. These are really expensive proteins. So now we can actually measure the phase behavior and how the phase behavior is shifted by adding drugs, which is what we're doing. So this is a way of screening and looking for new drugs just using what we know as physicists and how we can understand the phase behavior. Then we can take that and go back into the cell and say, if we add the drug to the cell, we see that impact the, uh, the uh, phase behavior of the, the droplets in the cell. And so it's, it's a, just an example to me of where my knowledge as a physicist can really have a big impact on doing something practical, but it's all biology. And I'll think of it completely different by biology. Okay, I was going to show you other things, um, but I think maybe, unless you want me to go on, it's getting late. Um, so maybe I'll show you just 30 seconds more. And then I'll shut up. They won't. Yes. Also, I um, that that's in terms of Alzheimer's is uh, fascinating. I know that it, I sorry. Just long story short, um, a few summers ago, my grandfather unfortunately passed away from it. So I'm very that's really impactful work. It's awesome. Um. So. You know, why I do this in the end is because I want to have impact. That's exactly why I do it. Uh, and that's the thing that actually you end up feeling good about. Um, because you can make a difference. Um, 
and students. One word that's going to, I'll, I'll explain the importance of this, and I'll also explain why, what drives me in fact. You ask, can you learn something deep mind? So let me tell you how I think about it. I'm going to show you how I think about things and how we try to do something and why it failed, but what we can do experimentally. So, you guys know what an energy landscape is? Energy landscape, well, we, all, we know as physicists, we know everything tries to minimize its energy, right? And so, this is an energy landscape. This might be for a molecule where this is the motion. It may be but back the photons in one direction, and you get an energy, uh, energy profile to function of separation. In another direction, different. So this is two dimensions. But it's multi-dimensional. But we, we know what they are, right? We know we can sort of design some basis space that we can design. I can only show you a two-dimensional plot, but it can be multi-dimensions. So we know how it how it works, and 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 we know you know we know all kinds of liability minimum. If we're trapped in one minimum, we'd like to get to a more a deeper minimum. We have to go over some barrier, do simulation, you simulate a milling, you raise the temperature, so you can jump over the barrier, or you pull a thing. It's a really good way of understanding the physics of what's going on in, as you minimize energy. So, what about evolution? Evolution has a fitness landscape. So you always want to get to something that's more fit than everything else. So how do I go to a fitness landscape for my energy landscape? Well, I just take this and I turn it upside down. And that's really all it is. It's this multi-dimensional space in fitness. You always want to go with something fitter. So you want to get the top of the number. And this dimensions now are really simple. They're just sequence. The problem is that if you think about like a, a an enzyme, say it's short end, 100, 100 amino acids. How many possible uh, how many possible amino acids? Are 100. Well, the total possible are 100 to the power 20, right? So that's uh, maybe 10 to the power 80. I don't know, 100. It's an enormous number. You want to go, you want to learn how to go from one place to another place. And there's this enormous fitness space. And if, if there's one different enzyme, there's that there's three pieces of DNA, three bases of DNA that codes for that. So there's a lot of different possible ways of coding. How you explore that is really possible. It's very hard to do. Um, oh, sorry. When I looked at fitness landscapes, that's what I saw. But no, sorry. Um, so the way the way you think about it is, um, if you're sitting here and you want to go to a higher, it's like a low energy zone, higher fitness point. How do you go? Well, you could climb up this ridge, up, 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 slowly, step by step, or you can take a big leap. You can do many changes at once. And how do you explore that? And we spend a lot of time trying to develop ways of doing it. Um, Francis Arnold won the Nobel Prize for recognizing that you could uh, change it. And you can uh, force enzymes to do this by saying that I'm only going, I'm going to make lots of changes in enzymes, and I'm going to watch and only pick those ones that come up along here. So there's ways of choosing that. What we've done is develop ways of, you know, and I feel like there's a huge number. So I figured that the Colonel Mel Prize winning work in one quantum of time, that's one graduate student life, she could look at maybe, or a graduate student could look at maybe a thousand different examples. Uh, the likelihood of finding one of these is very big. We figured out now ways of getting up to 10 to the 15. It's still small, but it's much larger. So now we can ask, how can we explore this fitness landscape and find something, either by combining it with machine learning, 
a divine understanding something about the local slopes. You understand something? You can tell about it's just an enormous amount of it's just this enormous landscape. So how do we do that? And why is that important? Well, one thing we realize we can do is using the same technology is it, again, it's a completely different way to look for drugs because we're just trying to optimize something that will bind to a receptor in the cell, just like the antibodies that are produced by the mRNA vaccines uh, bind, well, they bind to the, uh, to the virus. You could also bind to the ACE receptors on the cell and block them, prevent the virus from binding them. It's a very powerful way of creating a drug. We're trying to use this whole technology not only to ask and explore the fitness landscape, but can we actually find drugs? This is just another example of what motivates me to combine my physics understanding way of thinking. You can always ask me. Always come and visit me. As Bob says, I'm just around the corner. My door is always open when I'm here. Just stop in if you want to know anything. Just stop in and see what we do in my lab. Our lab's on the fifth floor of uh, McKay. Welcome to visit. Okay, well, thank you very much. Any uh, questions? Okay, good. We'll leave that for uh, in person. Uh, <laughs>